good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you happen to be tuning into this. It's great to be together uh, in this way. Can't wait till we can be back together in person, hopefully soon. Uh, it's almost been three weeks now without a case in New South Wales. But uh, I hope that you enjoyed being a part of last week's pilgrimage. If you were able to be there uh, as we walked together, enjoyed God's creation, shared some food, shared some stories together, uh, connected together as a wider community and met some new people. And if you are one of those new people, I just want to say thanks so much for coming last week if you did uh, or if you've been tuning into our content over the last little while I hope that you've been blessed and encouraged and I just want to say welcome we're really glad that you are here uh, with us so part of the purpose of last week was that we wanted to remember that although we've all come from different places God's brought us together uh, for this moment and that we've all got something to bring to the table you me all of us uh, and that I felt like God was calling us to mark a moment in time a kind of period in our journey to remember that the God who's brought us this far will carry us into the season ahead. And actually, uh, those are the themes that um, kind of work their way through the book of Joshua, which is a book that we are going to start looking at from today over the next couple uh, of months as we lead up to Easter. And so last week, in a sense, kind of set the scene for the rest of this book. Now, the book of Joshua, it's a tale of adventure, spies, armies, lots of action. Uh, God is very much the hero of the story. And Joshua, whose name actually means God saved, is like God's right-hand guy throughout the story. And actually, uh, the book of Joshua is all about how God is faithful to fulfill his promises. Um, and God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness actually is uh, so complete that by the end of the book, uh, in Joshua 23, 14, Joshua says this to the nation of Israel. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises of the Lord your God gave you has ever failed. Every promise has been fulfilled, not one has failed. So like the question might be, can uh, we rely on God to keep his promises? And according to Joshua, he would say 100% yes. God is totally dependable. He is utterly dependable and we can trust him completely. And so this book of Joshua is a book that's relevant for you. If you sometimes wonder, does God really answer prayer? Or is God really active and alive today? Or for those of us who desire like a fresh assurance of God's dependability. If you fit into any of those categories, then this book is totally for you. So we're going to be looking at it as a faith community over the next couple of months leading up till Easter. And we're kind of going to fly over the top of it, do a high level kind of look at this book on Sundays. But then we're going to be delving much deeper into it in our midweek city group. So if you're not one of those, if you're not a part of one of those city groups already, it's a great time to jump in on them. Uh, reach out for details. We'll find you something uh, that works for you. And I'd also encourage you to be reading along through the book of Joshua as we are going through it together uh, as a community. I was speaking to someone on Sunday, actually, who said that last year, they read through the book of Joshua and they were so blessed by it. And when they heard that we were going to be preaching about it, they got really excited um, remembering how God had spoken to them uh, previously when they read through the book. So I'd encourage you to read along. Uh, you can jump on uh, the Bible app and they've got a bunch of Joshua Bible reading plans on there, uh, which will be an encouragement to you as well. And in terms of Sundays, what are they going to look like for us over the next little while? Well, we would love to be gathering together, obviously, and we're hopeful that that is going uh, to be soon. But right now, the current restrictions that are in place would meet, uh, make meeting at the Doherty Centre a little bit uninspirational. So we are just keeping a close eye on what the government is uh, saying and uh, the information that they are releasing. And when things um, ease up, we would love to be back together meeting um, in person as a wider community. But having said that, let's not wish away the time that God has us meeting as we are now in these house churches. There's still much that he's been doing uh, in and through us, much that he's been teaching us. Uh, we've learned so much. And so let's not wish away this time, but really lean into the things that God has been doing. And please stay posted for more information about our coming events because we've got some exciting things planned. So, Let's set the scene a little bit for the book of Joshua. Well, God had said to Abraham right back in Genesis 12 that he wanted to make Abraham and his descendants a great nation. And then in Genesis 15, a few chapters later, God says to Abraham, and I'm going to give this nation 
uh, a promised land. I'm going to give them the land between the river in Egypt and the great river Euphrates. Uh, but hundreds of years have passed and uh, the people of God still don't have land to call their own. Even worse, actually, they've been in slavery in Egypt for like 400 years by this stage. Now, God raises up Moses while they're in captivity in Egypt to lead the people uh, out of slavery. But then they end up wandering the desert for another 40 years. So like, it's like, you think a great nation, they've been in slavery and now they're wandering. Like it doesn't sound much like a great nation to me. But that gets us to where we pick up the story in the book of Joshua. They're right now on the cusp, right on the fringe of this long promised, uh, long awaited promised land. But then their leader, Moses, dies. And then Joshua is appointed as the new leader of Israel. But can you imagine what it would have been like for Joshua to uh, kind of step into the massive shoes of this iconic figure, Moses? Actually, all throughout the book of Joshua, in fact, the whole Old Testament, uh, Moses gets talked about all the time. I can imagine that for Joshua as this uh, new leader, it would have felt like this dark cloud of the memory of Moses or this bad smell of the memory of Moses was kind of hanging around for him. And I think also a question that would have been in uh, Joshua's mind as he uh, took on this role was, are the people going to follow me the way that they used to follow Moses? And is God going to be with me the way that he was with Moses as well? And so rather than reading the first chapter myself, I want to ask you to pause right now uh, so that if you're on your own, you can read it yourself. Or if you're with other people, somebody who you're together with, read the first chapter for you. So get the button right now and pause this. Welcome back. Well, there are three big questions that I want us to ask and answer briefly uh, for the rest of this message. Uh, the first question is, what's the big deal with the land that gets talked about in this chapter? The second big question is, what's the big deal with those three tribes, Gad, Reubenites, and the half tribe of Manasseh? And the third big question I want us to ask is, what's the big deal with that phrase, be strong? and courageous. That appears a number of times in the chapter as well. So question number one, what's the big deal about the land? Well, the word land itself gets mentioned seven times in this opening chapter itself. And it kind of makes you wonder, like, what is the big deal about? It? What is the big deal about this particular chunk of dirt? Why did God work so hard to get the people of God to uh, be able to settle in this particular chunk of real estate? Now, that's actually it's a really big topic and it's a really big deal. We're just going to kind of brush over the surface of it now. But here's the basic headline. Historians had called this territory the crossroads of the earth. Or it also gets called, and I quite like this, the turnstiles of the ancient world world. Now, if you were to go anywhere through this part of the world at the time, there was this one main highway that ran up the um, length of the promised highway. A little bit like on the North Shore, we've got like one highway that runs the length of the North Shore. And here's the headline. What, what God was saying was, if, if God was going to bless all the nations, then he wanted his people to be central. He wants us to be accessible. He doesn't want us to be off to the side. He doesn't want us to be tucked away in the corner. Missionally, what it means to live at the crossroads of the earth is where the mountains of God's people meet the coastal plains of the pagans. So we're meant to kind of straddle these two cultures and bring shalom or the peace of God to a world that is in chaos. And God doesn't want us to be in the corner. He doesn't want us to be tucked away in a holy little huddle or left out the back. Actually, this chunk of dirt comes with a mission. This chunk of dirt comes with purpose. And our patch, our patch on the North Shore, our, our patch in Chatswood, um, it always is going to border pagan lands. And part of our mission is to bring shalom, again, the peace of God, to those that we are neighbors to in our world. That's the big deal about the land. What about, what's the big deal about these three tribes that often seem to get mentioned together? The, the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Well, you need a little bit of context for that. Back in Numbers uh, 32, these tribes almost derailed the whole of Operation Promised Land. Now, they asked Moses to give them the land on the east 
of the river Jordan so that they didn't have to cross over to the west uh, and battle the Canaanites, which is where the promised land actually was. Now, when Moses heard this, he was uh, furious. It was like it threatened to derail the whole operation because if they weren't going to come with the rest of the Israelite nation, then at best it would have weakened the army that was going. But at worst, maybe everybody would have said, you know what, stuff it. None of us will go. We'll all just stay here. And the potential was that that kind of disobedience against God could lead to another 40 years of wandering the wilderness. So Moses went into negotiations with these three tribes and he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You can have this land as long as you promise to come with us when we do cross over to battle against those Canaanite, the Canaanite nation. And so right here at the start of Joshua, there's some context we need to understand. It's like, will these tribes, these Transjordan type tribes, as they get called, will they actually cross over to help clear that the land that they had promised that they would. There's this kind of undercurrent of tension, which is addressed here in chapter one. Now, I don't know if you've seen the movie Snowpiercer, uh, but Heather and I just started watching the Netflix uh, series adaptation recently. And uh, I mean, it's a it's a quite a strange idea. It's a futuristic, apocalyptic um, type scenario. And there's this 1001 carriage long uh, train that's revolving around an earth that's largely frozen. They're the only people alive on earth anymore. And there's some like people right at the back of the train who are kind of the lower class of people and they're called tailies and uh, they have this kind of call sign where they all put their fists into the center of a circle and they say one tail to kind of identify uh, their togetherness. Or maybe you're more of a high school musical fan and uh, maybe a little bit like me, you often find yourself humming along to we're all in this together now. I don't know the rest of the words, but that kind of sense of being all in this together. Or maybe like me, you grew up with the three musketeers and their famous uh, refrain, all for one and one for all. What are all three of those? One tale, we're all in this together, or all for one and one for all have. There's that sense of being committed to each other and being committed to the cause. So right here at the start of Joshua, we have this question hanging over the people of God and the future of them. How are these three tribes going to respond? Are they going to stay committed to the cause? Are they going to stay committed to each other? Are they going to join their brothers in crossing the River Jordan and battling the Canaanites like they promised that they would? How are they going to respond? Well, we heard it just then in Joshua chapter 1, verse 16. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we'll do. And wherever you send us, we'll go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Like, unless you understand the context, you don't realize if they don't hold up their part of the bargain, if they split off and do their own thing, if they jump ship, then the whole battle could have been lost before it even began. Now, you might be tempted to think, hang on a second, there's 12 tribes. So there must be like enough people that can go off and battle the land. Like, is it really matter if two and a half of the tribes don't come with? Like, there's still plenty of other people. But what this shows us right at the beginning is that none of the tribes are dispensable. Let's bring it into our day. You might be tempted to think sometimes, look, there's a lot of people in my city group. There's a lot of people at church. Am I really going to be missed if I'm not there? Well, part of what we did last week on that pilgrimage as we all brought something to the table was to remember that if we don't play our part, our part doesn't get played. Now, I don't say that because I want to guilt you into attendance. Like that is the furthest thing from my mind. That's not what I want to do. But I, I say it because I want you to know you are valued and you are valuable. There is no way at all that you are dispensable. You are an indispensable part of this body. We love you, we need you, and we need what God has given you to bring. All tribes were necessary to cross over the River Jordan to battle the Canaanites. Then, as this chapter finishes, the final thing that they say is, only be strong and courageous. They say that back to Joshua, which, which leads us to the, that final question of the three is, what is the big deal with this phrase? Why does it get mentioned a number of times? Now, it's, it's very obviously famous refrain from this chapter. But actually, God says it to Moses back in Deuteronomy 31. And actually, the, 
letter, uh, the author of the letter to the Hebrews says it in Hebrews 13, 5 as well. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. So what's the big deal with uh, this verse? Well, there are a couple of things here. First thing is this. When God says it to Joshua, Joshua takes that inspiration and speaks to the people who then take Joshua's inspiration and say back to him, be strong and courageous. There's this kind of like circular encouragement that happens. And the big idea is, is this, miraculous conquests are possible if we stand together and encourage each other to be strong and courageous. Miraculous conquests are possible. See, when everyone can look at each other and the leaders don't resent the people and the people don't resent the leaders and the leaders' first impulse is to encourage the people and the people say back to the leaders, be strong and courageous. When that kind of environment happens, miracles are possible. See, the mountains and the obstacles that we face in this life are overcomable if we stand together and face them together. So the first big idea from this verse is there's that kind of sense of mutual strength, mutual encouragement. We can face these battles together and see miraculous conquests if we together encourage each other to be strong, strong and courageous. The second big idea about this verse is, uh, is this. I just want to look at it a little bit more closely. Let's look at what it says in verse 9. If you're strong and courageous, the Lord... Sorry, I misread that. Um, because you're strong and courageous, the Lord your God will be with... Oh, sorry, I misread that again. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It's not if you're strong and courageous, God will be with you. It's not because you are strong and courageous, the Lord is with you. It is be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And, and it's subtle, but it is so important because again, it's, it's like little picture of the grace of God. See, God being with Joshua wasn't dependent on whether Joshua could muster strength and courage in and of himself. See, God being with Joshua was what happened first. And as a response, Joshua was, Joshua was able to be strong and courageous. Because like religion would tell us, if you're strong and courageous, then maybe God might want to identify with you. But actually what the gospel tells us is that God identifies with you and therefore we can live strong and courageous. Religion would tell us like, if I obey, then God might accept me. But the gospel tells us God accepts me. I'm assured of his love. He's with me wherever I go. Therefore, I can choose to obey. And friends, like there is an ocean of difference between working for acceptance from God and working from a place of acceptance before God. Like you're already accepted. He's already with you wherever you go. And right here, early in the biblical narrative, it's one of the first books of the Bible, we get this glimpse into what this God, Yahweh, is really like. He, he's the God who takes the first step. He's the God who makes the first move. He's the God who takes the initiative, who runs toward his returning children. He's the God who left heaven's glory, uh, lived among his people, among his creation, and then hung, hung on a tree for their sake. He's the God who goes first. It's always God first because that's the grace of God. It's so wonderful to know that that's who he is like. This promise here in these verses is that God's presence and strength will go with us. And like we desperately need that. We desperately need that as individuals and we desperately need that as a community. The promise of God's presence and strength with us. So more than just because it was time to look at an Old Testament book together. Actually, we felt God prophetically speak through this book of Joshua to us, for us as a faith community together. There's a number of things that we've already touched on that we felt God like prophetically highlight for us. But let me just remind you of a few. As the great uh, modern philosopher Zac Efron said, we're all in this together. We, we are. We're also, we're a people on the move. And, and although it might have felt like we've been wandering in the desert for a long time, what's becoming clear is God's been with us actually the whole way. 
And as far as we've come, like the Israelites, we've not actually fully arrived yet. For the Israelites, there's still going to be battles to fight before they can claim their land. And much, many of the battles we're going to fight are going to be spiritual battles. It's going to be spiritual warfare. And God also wants us to occupy the crossroads of our nation. He wants us to occupy the crossroads of our culture for missional purposes. And also because although, although we may fight, Actually, the battle belongs to the Lord. It, it's his battle. And ultimately, the thing he's calling us into is not to fight more, but he wants to call us into a place of rest. The battle belongs to the Lord. Now, we are, though, going to go into some battle tonight. So if you are watching this on Sunday, uh, we'd love to have you join us tonight. We're gathering to pray in Roseville. Uh, if you'd like to reach out, if you don't have them already, reach out and we'll send you the details of where we're meeting to do some spiritual warfare together as we carry this church community before God in prayer. There's also going to be some uh, discussion questions that are going to come up in a moment, which you're welcome to reflect on and perhaps use to stimulate your conversation. And then uh, we're going to hear from somebody who's going to share about their kind of heart and passion for what they'd love to see God do in this city. But I'd really like to encourage you, if you're with other people right now, or even if you're not, let's be praying that the promise of God's presence and his strength would be fulfilled in us, in our day, in our time, amongst us as a faith community. I love you guys heaps. God bless you. Look forward to being with you again soon. Okay, what I would love to see God do in our city, I recently read... A psalm in Psalm 17, verse 7, David writes, um, Show me the wonders of your great love. And that's kind of what I've been praying and asking God for, for the city. It's like God's love is what will change our city. And we need his love to turn, um, you know, hardened hearts into flesh. Uh, we need his love to unite us as, you know, multiple churches. And we need his love in a pandemic to love those around us who are filled with anxiety and have no peace. So I'm asking him for greatness. I'm asking him to show us again his great love because we know it and we as Christians um, should experience it. But there's a world out there that has no idea of how amazing his love is and his kindness leads to repentance. So yeah, those of you who have been in prayer meetings with me will know that for a while now I have been praying for revival and I will continue to do so. I'm asking God for revival for Sydney. Go Jesus!